Sure. Last but not least, we have Adam Devonder about his new book, Developer Marketing Does Not Exist. Hello, Adam. How are you? Hi there. Yeah, I'm doing well. It's great to be here. Yeah, great to have you. And again, for for the the weighted book that everybody wants wanted to have from you, finally is out. That's right. <laughs> yeah, developer marketing, right? So uh, uh, yeah, let's let's dive directly into the content, and so we can we have some questions, right? Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, it's great great to be here. I'm a big fan of API days. I'm sorry I can't see everybody in person. I'm sure we'll we'll have a chance to do one of those uh, sometime soon. Um, and it has been a while since I've been on a plane. And luckily, I've never had anything uh, difficult happen on on a plane. But we do remember uh, stories like of uh, the the plane that as it left New York had first one and then two impacts with geese. And of course, we know that famously uh, because. Uh, because we had saw these pictures on social media. And then, of course, everything turned out okay. And when everything turns out okay, it turns into a Tom Hanks movie. But as soon as we all knew that everything was okay with that situation, that's when you started seeing people talking about uh, the details like, uh, here we're calling it a bird strike. It should be called a plane strike. Uh, that sort of thing. And actually, a year after that event, Saturday Night Live did a, a, a big joke about reading the names of, of the geese that were that perished in, in that accident. Uh, uh, Goose Springsteen was my favorite on, on that list. But uh, what they were doing is really what I'm talking about when I say developer marketing does not exist. And that is flipping the perspective and recognizing that you may have an API that you want developers to use, whether that's developers within your own company or external to, to your company. And the way that you approach that with developers should be from their own perspective. And uh, Mehdi mentioned the book. So the book starts off with a story of the matrix and when neo goes to visit the oracle and he meets a young boy who appears to be bending a spoon and the boy says there is no spoon he was talking about sort of this uh this illusion this uh uh living in the matrix where the spoon doesn't exist yet you're seeing it move before your eyes and that is that's the, the switch in perspective that we need to take as we think about marketing to developers. Uh, and remember that I said that doesn't exist. This is an API conference. So I want to make sure that I put this in the terms that API practitioners can understand here. So here we have a request to developer marketing and we get a 404. So clearly it does not exist. But what what do I really mean, though, when I when I say that? I mean that developers don't want to be marketed at. They don't want to be promoted to. And again, this includes those within your own company who are being told that they need to use a particular API or in a particular way. And often the mistakes that get made in these situations are that you tell me what this is. It's so much so much about the features of this API or what it does, or the worst is that I can't live without it. It has this amazing feature that you need to use and it will solve all of your problems. And developers are way more skeptical than that. So we don't wanna do these things. And so I'm gonna tell you what to do instead. And the rest of the talk will be focused on that. So that switch in developer marketer perspective, this is the perspective that you should have if you are talking about your APIs, even if you don't have marketer in your title. So if I'm the developer that you're speaking to and you want to see it from my, my perspective, you should tell me what you think 
You should show me how to do it and teach me why it matters. And that's really the philosophy that the book itself goes into. And it's, it's organized by the different tools in the marketer toolbox. So these are five of them that we're going to go through real quickly now, applying that perspective tweak. These will look familiar to you. Uh, and, uh, and some of these are, are multiple chapters. Content is multiple chapters in the book. But again, we're going to look at each of these with these three things that are the developer marketer perspective, the things that I want you to, to memorize before we're out of this is tell me what you think. Show me how to do it. Teach me why it matters. And the first place we're, we're going to look is documentation. Now, I know you're saying, ah, I know everything about documentation. We, we've been talking about it all day here. It's important. Well, if that's the case, uh, I want you to go over to, to the comments. Even if you're watching this recorded, there's, there's comments there. And, and let's quiz you. Let's see which of these is the better docs. So go ahead and put, is it A or is it B? And you should commit to this. Right. And usually when I do this, there are more B's than A's. Uh, and B, I mean, you can see even through the blurred there, there's sort of, it looks like there's the response is shown in the docs, which is which is great. Uh, then some people do choose A. Maybe it looks uh, simpler or uh, they know that uh, this is, of course, a uh, a trick to, uh, to show you here. A are the Stripe docs, often mentioned as the best documentation, the pinnacle of what you're after, uh, just happens to have the CSS removed from it. And then uh, B is the kitten API. No offense to learning about uh, breeds of cats via API, but maybe doesn't quite have the potential business impact of, uh, <laughs> of payments, right? So the point here is, of course, what you already know, it's not what the docs look like. It's what is within the docs that matters. And are you hitting on those three things that I mentioned? The tell me what you think. You wouldn't expect that that would be within documentation, which should be just the facts, right? But here, I love what Begin has done. I'm not sure if you can see it on here, but uh, they specifically call out should require should be five minutes, and then uh, you don't need to be a CTO to use it. So they're they're having this opinion, and you all have opinions and point of views. Uh, your company was founded on those opinions and point of views, and uh, and so being able to inject those in everything that you publish, including documentation. One thing to watch out for here is sometimes those point of views are so large that you have this huge expanding concepts section like this here. I mean, I didn't even expand all of the potential areas I could have in these Ethereum docs. And still we have to get through foundational to topics, which have several, and then the Ethereum stack is like more foundation before finally, okay, there we are, the Ethereum client APIs, and we can sort of start to get started. So. Be aware that you don't want to front load too much of that. Try to fold it in to your documentation as you go. Don't give someone homework. You need to learn all about this before you can even get started. And then show me how to do it. And Twilio is a great example here. Oh, what? Do, 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 do. Yep, this is the, uh, the time to first uh, Twilio reference. So someone mark, someone mark it. I'm not sure how long that took me. I, I, I'm sure that Jeff Lawson, the CEO of Twilio this morning, had a shorter time to first Twilio reference. Uh, it would be hard for him not to. But uh, uh, but the, the point here is to make it go as long as you can. But I, I just couldn't because this is such a great example of, uh, and I'll point out a few reasons why. It's a specific use case, a specific language, even a specific framework and it walks through not just the code, it doesn't dump me into a, a GitHub repo with the code, but it shows me the code as I go, the important bit, 
and describes what it is. So it's showing me how to do it. It's definitely documentation, but goes way beyond just the facts. And then finally, in the documentation section, the teach me why it matters. And here I've used plaid as an example. And these use cases are precisely what I mean. And if you can include use cases in your docs and really everywhere possibly, uh, it will help people understand why it matters. And so here you see not only are they talking about their products on the left, which is very internally focused sort of term, but then they're talking about what you want to achieve, why it matters, and the use cases help do that. And another area where you can, you can show why it matters and you can inject use cases is content. When I was at Programmable Web, I saw many, many press releases about new APIs. And so I came to fear these five words. We are proud to announce. Because nothing that comes after those words is something a developer wants to read. It's all of the things <laughs> that here, it's the what it is or what it does and why, uh, how you can't live without it is there. And so instead, again, you want to flip that perspective. What does a developer want to see? Whether this is an announcement or it's a, a blog post that you put out. In this case, the tell me what you think here from Optic. It's okay to break your API. Boom. That There is an opinion there, and that is something that, I want to see more about. I want to understand uh, what they think. And show me how to do it. We worked with OpenCage on this. Uh, it digs into reverse geocoding, but that happens to be what OpenCage does. But it doesn't say, use OpenCage, use OpenCage. Instead, it walks through, okay, developer, you want to build a reverse geocoder, you want to, to be able to put this together on your own, we will show you how to do it. And if you show someone, uh, I, I wrote about this on heavy bit as the, I call it the uh, uh, developer content mind trick. If you can take someone as far along as you possibly can on how to build it, they're going to trust that you understand the topic and Maybe they will build it on their own and they'll thank you for the help, but a good number of, of developers will end up saying, oh, they've found all the edge cases and know everything about it. Maybe I should use their tool that does exactly this. And then teaching me why it matters. In this case, it's, it's caching from Auth0. That's not directly connected to their product, but if I'm a dev who's doing this research again it's i'm i'm being i'm looking for education and inspiration not promotion and that's what they're bringing with this blog post events so by events i don't mean webhooks that you've been hearing about all day but events like api days and it's very common to be a common part of the marketer toolkit to attend events and I mean, it's a little bit meta. I'm doing it now. Let's, there's a, there we go. That's, that's me. I took a screen cap. Uh, I remembered to wear the same shirt. So that works. We're here at this event and yes, I'm talking about my book, uh, but I don't, I don't really have a thing to sell and you're not hearing, hearing me talk about how you should hire me instead. I'm attempting to do the things that I that I'm describing in here, and that uh, and that's what you should do as you go to events as well. Uh, I I picked out a couple of talks from tomorrow here that really jumped out at me. I I know these two gentlemen, uh, and I'm sure those talks will be great. But in particular, the titles are what got me because they're telling me what they think. The why are API products so hard? Alan is is gonna tell 
<laughs> going to tell you about that and and explain and share that pain that you have. And wow, low, low code APIs that don't break. There's definitely an opinion there. And that's the kind of, kind of content uh, to bring to events. Of course, it doesn't have to be an event someone else does. This is a, a webinar. I don't actually know this company, but I went searching for API webinar and I liked this approach of of telling them the, how to protect your API. There's a benefit there and a free tool set, another benefit. I was a little concerned when the follow-up mentioned that there's an ad-free version of the webinar because again, we don't want to promote it developers. We want to be able to educate, inspire. And in terms of where I've seen this work the best is what Mashery used to do and not from the stage where you expect to have more education than promotion, but from a place where you'd expect to be promoted to, and that's the expo hall. And instead, the approach Mashery took was to have a puzzle that developers would have to uh, attempt to, to figure out. So they're getting people thinking about things, getting them back to the booth for hints. And you can see and granted, they gave things away to to attract developers, also, but uh, it it's a, it goes way beyond a, a business card into a into a fishbowl, right? Where where you're able to really latch on and talk about APIs in this case, um, and while they're grappling with sort of a problem, a fun problem, so. Uh, that's uh, that's a, a great approach that I uh, yeah have have loved since I mean that what that was 2014 so another approach at events advertising again is going to be a a place you would expect to see full promotion but uh, we know that when that is the case that people get sad like Ralphie in a Christmas story. When he waited and waited, and then it was just a crummy commercial. And so how can you avoid that with these same approaches of wanting to educate and inspire, not promote? Tell them what you think. Stripe here with uh, with something that is just, is just so not directly connected to payments and yet is right in line with their developer audience talking about the adaptive mindsets and someone who is who's going to be interested in this is going to be interested in efficiently building great software which is the kind of kind of developer that stripe wants to wants to attract then the last week in ap api uh, last week in aws newsletter really works closely with all of their sponsors to create things that that their audience actually wants to hear about. And so, you know, some of these like weekly live demo, it, that sounds like it could be a little pitchy, but observability office hours, that's going and actually having a conversation with someone who uh, knows a lot about a topic, being able to uh, get an ebook and not have, have a, uh, have a question, um, have a, a call to action that's sign up for our thing right now. This goes a long way toward building that trust with developers. And even here in Google ads, we see it. Now you, these look like organic results and you might say that's because of design. I mean, there is just a tiny little ad, uh, Thing there that, sh that shows that it's an ad. But I would say another reason that it looks organic is that this is like really helpful things for someone who's searching headless e-commerce. They would want to know what it is and, and why to use it and to be able to get kind of the 101 type of content and that educational materials. And there's nothing in there that says you should choose this, this particular provider and Similarly, I bumped into this on, on Facebook. Again, not saying you should sign up for 
launch darkly in this case, but instead this guide that describes uh, the best practices. And if you go to that page, oh, you have to scroll way down before they even mention their company name. So here we have advertising, the most promotional of mediums you can imagine. And it's possible to have these approaches that it, uh, that is the developer perspective, keeping the developer perspective in mind and, uh, and providing something that they actually want. And that should continue not just from your ad, but through the entire experience. And this final area is the, uh, a great way to ensure that it does. And that is to look at, uh, consider having tools as a way to be able to attract developers. So for the, the old school API practitioners in the crowd, go ahead and go to the comments again and tell me who is this barfing unicorn? What is it from? I can't see the comments, but I hope there's a few in there that have referenced Hurl. Hurl was started as a weekend project at a hackathon, a Ruby hackathon, I think. And then it became Twilio's first ever acquisition. It was acquired with a credit card payment, a pretty simple, uh, pretty simple process, uh, and became a place where Twilio developers, uh, those who wanted to use Twilio, could try out API calls. And that was right in the browser. You could use it with Hurl. It went, o went over to Runscope. When John Sheehan went, went there, he acquired it from Twilio. And it was part of the Runscope uh, community projects. They owned some of them, and then they sponsored others. And so they had this tool approach uh, which I write about in the book, and which John, um, and which John uh, talked about at Heavy Bit as well, where, um, yeah, where they they use this as certainly an acquisition, but also a way to be able to support the community and uh, and then yeah, be able to have these tools that help developers out. So let's look at a few examples of that sort of modern, the tell me what you think. Uh, Stoplight has a, a linter, which is used on open API documents, but can, can be used in other JSON and YAML files as well. Open source, and there's a, a big part of what Stoplight thinks within having this as open source. It's the importance of open source. It's the importance of of uh, being able to have a linter and and apply rules to a particular do, uh, definition. So we see that sort of what they think within this tool that is made available to the developer community. Similarly for Auth0, their JOT token uh, tool, which probably all of us on the <laughs> uh, watching this uh, have used at one point or another, being able to encode and decode and understand more about JOT tokens. And then teaching me why it matters. In this case, uh, it's replicated. It says we they have some things that enterprise grade companies need. And you can go and, and do an assessment to be able to see where you are. And then, of course, in all of these cases, that there is a, a commercial point that where a developer would jump off. But this tool itself, just like all of these examples here, doesn't doesn't require the company to to grab the shoulders of the developer and and shake it and say, uh, and say you must buy our product. It's that flip of the perspective and. Remember, you can always do that. Uh, and this is a description of Wizard of Oz. Spoiler alert for those of us who have not seen it. But there's always an opportunity to, to flip the perspective. And so 
the way we did that here was to, you can say it with me now. It's okay. You, you, you're muted. Tell me what you think. <laughs> Show me how to do it. Teach me why it matters. And you can find out more about that in the book. And if, uh, if we have time with uh, questions right now. Yeah, we are. Hey, thank, you very much. thank you very much, Adam, for, for this. Uh, so actually, I, I don't have my copy of the book right now, but uh, I, I left it at home before coming to the studio. Um, but th the thing is, uh, yeah, you say developer marketing does not exist. And actually, on the cover page, you have this Ben Spoon, right, from the Matrix yeah. movie, right? Yeah. So it doesn't exist, but it exists, right? Well, so... So here's here's what I say to that. I say developer marketers exist. There are probably <laughs> developer marketers like myself uh, attending API days, and they might look at developer marketing does not exist and say, hey, you're saying that my field doesn't exist. No, I say developer marketers exist, but developer marketing doesn't. And somehow we have to figure out what to do about that. And I think the answer, <laughs> as I've, as I've uh, discussed in this talk and at length in the book is uh, is to flip that perspective and say, okay, let's pretend that developer marketing doesn't exist. Let's you know, let's acknowledge that we're living in the matrix, and uh, yeah, and and let's approach it as if it doesn't. And by doing that, that actually ends up being the best way to reach developers. So it seems, you know, with, with APIs, the main goal is to transform a classic sales process, sales software cycle process into a sales service, sales service approach. You know, like people just, is there, you come, you, there is the value, there is what you can integrate. And you decide when you want to integrate, how do you, do, do you want to integrate it? So is it, after all, the developer marketer's job just to transform uh, outbound into inbound? You know, let developers decide and choose and discover and integrate if they want. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what that if you if you again look at that perspective of what the developer wants, like the same way they don't want to be promoted to, they don't want to show up and and have a button that says contact sales. They don't want to schedule a demo. They want to see it now. They want to play with it. The the reason that that mashery um, uh, puzzle worked was that it allowed developers to, to play with something. They didn't know that they were part of a marketing gimmick, uh, or maybe they did, but they didn't care because it was fun, right? So in the same way, developers want to come, they want to be able to try out the API. Um, I mean, thankfully, we're mostly past this, but it used to be that, that you couldn't even get documentation sometimes when it was, I you know, click here to schedule a demo, and then we'll show you what the API can actually do. And it's, no, that's not the direction that developer, developers want to say, can it do the thing that I want? And let me see if I can figure that out. And then we'll talk. Yeah. So this morning with Jeff Lawson, we we're talking about the ask your developer mindset. Yeah. Uh, uh, right. But so what is today to you the real power or influence of developers inside companies? All right. So, and at some point, can we go to just ask your developer to trust completely your developer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, it, and I enjoyed his book and was, was actually surprised at, uh, at the audience that it was oriented toward because it really is oriented toward the sort of business and executive uh, audience to say, you to really, it could be called trust your developer. I think that's what he's, what he's trying to say, right? But uh, yeah, I think that there's there's room to expand there as far as uh, uh, being able to have more of that trust uh, within your organization. But there's also, I mean, it's just the reality that developers are discovering tools on their own and they're going to bring those to your, your company. And so it's happening already, regardless of whether uh, whether you as uh, you know and speaking to the executives in the audience or those you know the audience for Jeff's book, uh, it's happening already. And so it's a matter of uh, 
of whether you want to uh, be along for that ride and recognize where recognize where it can help you. Um, for API providers, there's also, you know, even if you have a an, an enterprise go-to-market plan, there's the part where when someone goes and, and asks the developer, because at some point they're going to say, hey, how hard does this look to, to integrate? Then you want to be able to have the developer experience that makes them quickly be able to say, oh, wow, this looks really easy. And even better if you have the developer awareness to where they don't even need to go check the site because they've heard about you already. And they say, oh, yeah, you, like if it's, if it's that, then we're good to go because I've already heard about this and I know that it's easy. And I know I've seen them uh, speak at conferences and I've seen uh, them write about the hard technical problems that they're solving. So yeah, so maybe ask your developers just the first step for executives, then the next right. one would be trust your developers, <laughs> That's right? That's right, yeah. The too. Yep. So we are, we, we are uh, at the end. If you have a last message to say about the fact that developer marketing does not exist, what would you say? What would you say? Well, I, it's a little bit like uh, like the the developers are already do, finding the tools. So I would say developers already have an approach that they want, and they're going to find that from someone, and they might as well uh, be educated and inspired by you, which would make it more likely that they will choose and use your APIs and your software. Yeah, thank you very much, Adam. So where we can find the book? Uh, it is on Amazon, or you can go to everydeveloper.com and get links to, I know this is an international audience, so they're, they're the international stores there, yeah. Yeah, so Amazon or international stores on everydeveloper.com. And just to say, it's a bliss. It's uh, nicely written and a and lot, uh, lot of value, a lot of uh, advice in a, in, in a really, uh, really understandable way, just if I can say. And even if you... Yeah. I've listened to many talks and about developer marketing. Uh, yeah, you rediscover things in, in a way you 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 said, oh, okay, like actually I, I understand it really well now. So yeah, thank you very much, Adam, for that. Oh, thank you. And man. yes, you're always invited 